Welcome to this webinar on the 2019 CPT and OPPS updates. The construct of this presentation is mostly to do with CPT changes. The first 50 slides and one hour are comprised of CPT changes. And then there's a somewhat abridged exploration into the policy changes and a couple of little details like inpatient only procedures for the last few slides of this, the last 15 minutes or so. So um, stay tuned for the first part that's relevant to most of us coders. And then if you're a uh, manager, um, biller, or policy wonk, you can stay tuned for the latter part. Um, but mind you, the CMS final rule was over 1,100 pages, so there are tons and tons of details um, that can't be included here, and you may refer to other presentations. I am Ed O'Byrne. I'm a director at the HIM Solutions Division at Healthcare Resource Group. Uh, I'm a former physician assistant in emergency medicine, and my current work involves uh, coding, auditing, consulting, and most importantly, and my favorite, educating in the realm of inpatient and outpatient coding and documentation. Briefly, the outline of this presentation before we get into it is the first bit is mostly to do with CPT coding and organized surgery first. We'd look into a couple of code deletions, some new technology and temporary codes, and uh, some of the medicine, radiology, and e &M changes. And then the last little bit is, is a somewhat shortened, but the parts that I think are relevant to um, coders, IP-only procedures, some APC and changes, um, ASC allowed procedures, and stuff like that too. So you'll know pretty quick when you get there. If it stops being relevant to you, you can skip right to the end to the title slide and get my email address and reach out and say hi. So let's dive into the biggest part of the presentation, that's a CPT surgery codes. I will go through these in order, roughly uh, numerically, from the 1000s up to the 6000s, only inserting uh, out of order codes if there's something relevant, like for example, if there's an insertion of a monitor surgery code and there's the monitoring service code from the medicine section, I'll go ahead and sneak that in there just because it makes sense. Now, not every single parenthetical note change for 2019 will be in this presentation. In fact, not every single code change will be in here, but I think we'll cover about 95% of them, and the rest will be either so obscure that you'll never encounter them, or they're abundantly self-evident in the CPT manual, so it's really hard to mess up anything, too. Nonetheless, still, I highly recommend that you uh, read your guidelines and parenthetical notes while coding in 2019, just like every year, particularly the first part of the year, and um, you'll be uh, hopefully safe by doing so. Fine needle aspiration with guidance. So here's an instance where a, a simple FNA, as we call it, fine needle aspirate code without and without imaging guidance. The with imaging guidance code has been deleted. That's 10022 and instead replaced by the actual uh, imaging modality for the guidance, ultrasound, fluoroscopy, CT, and MRI. The codes you see here are for the initial lesion FNA biopsy and there is an additional code for an additional lesion biopsy, not an, an additional needle pass. An FNA biopsy is done on a, a semi-solid or a liquid lesion, uh, such as a cyst, somewhere in tissue, where a very small needle can be inserted in a small amount of fluid, and in that fluid, some tissue clumps or cells can be found. This is distinct from a core needle biopsy in which an actual solid tissue plug is removed from the um, from the lesion itself. So an FNA is very convenient to be done. It's a very little recovery time, small chance of infection or complication. Here you see an FNA of a pancreas of normal cells on the right. These are stained cells, they're not blue in the body. Normal pancreas cells and cancerous cells, which are much larger, deep, more deeply stained and a different kind of looking nuclei and they multi-lobulated nuclei inside too. Just wanted to throw that up so you'd see what an FNA biopsy looks like. And these are surrounded by the fluid as they're sort of dripped onto the slide and then stained, different from a solid core biopsy too. Now one thing I would caution you to watch out for if you're in a position to do this is to look out for erroneous radiology charges. So now that these are bundled with the guidance modality, for example, an FNA done with ultrasound, the rad tech might be tempted to just throw on a diagnostic ultrasound or even an, or an ultrasound guidance. Uh, charge as well. Um, sometimes on the sly, not on the abstract that we're working with, but the final bill. Um, if you're in a, a situation where you can be vigilant for that kind of thing, do. Um, because now these are bundled. Uh, for example, also a diagnostic uh, CT 
done in the same day. It's not impossible for that to be done, but if it's done just for the FNA guidance, it's now bundled into, in this instance, 10009. A couple of other odds and ends on the FNA aspiration guidelines. Uh, 10021, that's the FNA without image guidance. That code still remains and is still occasionally used, probably in an office environment. Here, for example, you may see this patient's PCP just doing an, a non-guided FNA biopsy of a superficial breast uh, lesion may be a cyst, hopefully, may be a cancer, but the way to find out is to um, withdraw a little bit of fluid, send it to pathology. Notice there's no CT or MRI gantry around here. There's no ultrasound transducer against the skin, and there's no uh, visible fluoroscopy C-arm here, no um, lead apron on the provider, too. So this is probably just a blind well, pal by palpation, unimaged guided, guided FNA, such as 10021. The additional lesion codes for each guidance modality simply add one digit to each of the codes. So, for example, we had 10005 for ultrasound initial lesion, 10006 is the ultrasound additional lesion. Being careful to note an additional needle pass of the same lesion, which is commonly done, is not uh, an quote coded as an additional lesion. Uh, so several passes into a cyst of a thyroid, for example, fluoro guided would be 10007, single instance of that. Now there are also many, many parenthetical note, notes added. What I found to be just basically everywhere there's a biopsy code in CPT, you'll find some parenthetical notes to just say, hey coder, be careful if this is an FNA, go to those codes instead. That this is not what you're looking at here for a solid core biopsy. So just, just kind of be careful and read the notes as you go. Another type of biopsy here is uh, focusing on skin biopsies. Uh, previously, we had a generic skin biopsy code 11100 and uh, 01 for additional lesions. Now we have the actual modality of the uh, actual removal of the tissue, tangential, punch, and incisional. We'll go into each of those one by one. So these are different ways of removing tissue from the skin, specifically the skin, to be sent for pathology for diagnostic purposes, not for removal purposes too. Um, so let's start with a lesion that might be subject to one of these types of biopsies. Here's a melanoma on the right here, as distinguished by the A, B, C, D, E characteristics of it. It's asymmetrical. So it's not round. Uh, the border is irregular. It's got a, uh, the color C is dark and it's uneven too. So it's dark here. Uh, it's generally dark, but it's a dark ur here, and light ur here, and it's uh, uneven. The diameter D is greater than six millimeters, which is a little worrisome. And the evolution of this lesion as it changes and gets larger in the shape uh, goes becomes different through time. Those are all worrisome um, findings to us as the patient with this growing on us or to the provider examining us that may require a tangential punch or incisional biopsy. I'll go ahead and say a melanoma like this or suspicion for melanoma that's large punch biopsy is probably where it's at. So these skin biopsies we're talking about now are solely for diagnostic purposes. If it's a intentional uh, therapeutic removal of the lesion, think about the excision lesions, whether benign or malignant. Now there's always going to be some overlap by using these different modalities for a definitive removal. And I'll we'll explore that a little bit, uh, but it's never going to be a slam dunk. It's going to require some documentation refinement uh, with us coders as uh, helping along. Uh, the, the skin biopsies can be performed independently or distinct from other excisions on the same day. And there will be some edits, but if it's a distinct excision of an, a different lesion, um, for example, an, an excision of a lesion on the right arm and a punch biopsy on the left arm, that's okay. We do code those separately. I'll also note not to confuse these or even any of the excision, uh, definitive excision codes with Mohs surgery. And this usually scream Mohs surgery right in the title and throughout. You can recognize these by an excision, which may be very small and may initially seem like an incisional or excisional biopsy sent to pathology. Uh, but then additional excisions as you go. I think only in a very um, brand new coder might mistake these, but nonetheless, a Mohs surgery is, is a definitive excision, has its own set of codes here, 17311 through 15. Um, also, I'll throw this out there just to be safe, is to say that incidental sending of excised tissue for pathology does not make that a biopsy. The intention of the excision needs to be diagnostic to find out what it is 
and not just sending any old excised tissue for PATH. Um, a definitive excision of a known malignancy is always going to be sent to pathology. If that's not a biopsy, please don't code it as such. Now, these new codes I've just mentioned are for skin and integument only. Naturally, there are dozens of other biopsy codes that are different from the skin. But within the skin, there are several what I think of as skin-like biopsy codes because these are covered by skin, mucous membrane, or sort of a, some sort of membrane that is skin-like. These have their own CPTs and their own families. The nails, the lips, penis, vulva, and perineum, the eyelid, um, conjunctiva is pretty easy to spot, but ear and eyelid would be excisions uh, where these are covered by what you may think of as skin, uh, but they have their own specific code. So the external ear skin has its own CPT code, so don't be tricked by that. Um, conversely, skin of the nose, like this basal cell carcinoma is probably what this is, of the nose, that is an ordinary skin um, biopsy code such as we're about to dig into. Um, so the nose doesn't yet have its own specific type. Starting with a tangential biopsy, most commonly called the shave biopsy, you may occasionally see it called scoop, saucer eyes, or a curette biopsy, or a curette is actually the instrument that can be used, and it may be sort of turned into a verb or an adjective like a curette biopsy, or curetted this lesion to send a biopsy, for example. The codes for these are 11102 and 03 for the additional lesion, again, not an additional shave of the same lesion. Now, shave removal of lesions is very common, unfortunately, and this can cause a little bit of confusion as to whether the intention was to fully remove the lesion uh, or whether it was to simply biopsy it. Um, I'll be honest with you, a simple shave biopsy without the intention to remove the whole lesion is not super common. Where it gets sticky is when the provider documents it as a shave biopsy removal. Um, if you're in an office or a facility of a size that you can work shoulder to shoulder with a provider to say, hey, look, you know, can you just say shave removal, comma, set for pathology? That will make our job so much easier as to clarify the intention as being a shave removal, such as in 11300, as distinct from the shave, a true shave biopsy or tangential biopsy 11002. So take that on a case basis. Know that there is a distinction, different work RVU, and it's a different animal technically. Punch biopsies uh, tend to be more commonly used in the true sense of a, of a biopsy, not a th therapeutic removal. And the new codes for a punch biopsy are 11104 and 05 for the additional lesions. Addition additional punches of the same lesion are not coded separately. And indeed, additional punches of large lesions are often done when there's available tissue enough to check for different morpho morphologies or just to be careful to actually get the pathology from a lesion that may be missed in one punch, so they'll do multiple punches. The punch does remove a full thickness of skin, therefore a simple closure is often required, one or maybe two st stitches, and that simple closure is included. An intermediate or complex uh, repair with biopsies and excisions is not included, but um, you'll rarely see a punch biopsy that requires more than just a, a single stitch, therefore simple closure, so don't code that separately. Um, now, once in a while, a very small, almost always benign lesion uh, can, like a actinic keratosis or molluscum tegiosum, that's just very obvious on the diagnosis, can be removed with a punch just for convenience because the operator is just used to using a punch. Um, it creates a, a very distinct little um, hole that can be closed with a single stitch. So that's possible to be done. So just be vigilant that if they're just simply using a punch biopsy to remove a lesion, um, that uh, we code that as a benign excision, even though the, mo the modality was a punch. Okay, that's not a biopsy. Rounding out the trifecta is the incisional skin biopsy, or I think of it as an excisional skin biopsy, but it requires incisions. And the initial lesion is 11106, and additional lesions are 11172. So again, incisional, excisional, however you want to think of it, but it's a full thickness with a sharp instrument like a, a scalpel. Um, but only part of the lesion, and that is by doing so as a definition of a biopsy rather than a therapeutic excision. Uh, this is a, a bit less common than the previously two mentioned. Um, it would typically be a quite large uh, lesion that would not be amenable to a shave or a punch, but rather an excisional biopsy, but still leaving some of the lesion. But using our imagination that there is a, a large uh, 
discolored lesion on the back of this patient's shoulder, and they incised uh, an ellipse and excised a piece of tissue here, and then a simple closure here being performed. Uh, that's all included too. Nonetheless, if the whole lesion is excised, think about the excision codes by malignant or benign um, and of the site uh, and of the size. Um, where, but in the rare instance you see an excisional biopsy of this type, we have the new codes for it too. Um, additional excisions of one lesion, super rare if that's the case, but again, um, those are not coded separately, but excisional biopsies of separate lesions of separate parts of the body are coded separately. Skin replacement surgery has uh, gotten pretty fancy these days, and we have not new codes, but a guideline revision to help us make the distinction between what is and what isn't skin substitute grafting. Where you'll find these notes is around the preparation codes, 15002 to 5, and the actual placement of the skin substitute grafting, 15271 to 78. When I started coding, it was a bit more clear between what was really a graft, like an allograft or a xenograft, from a tissue bank or from a pig skin that was sort of purified and cleaned up to be used as a skin graft and on the other end of the spectrum just a bandage which was just a non-stick gauze or something like that. Now these have kind of grown together to meet in the middle when it's trickier to tell what is a skin substitute graft. So the notes have been changed and this is an ever-evolving thing but to help us make the distinction that a skin substitute graft includes allografts, xenografts, and importantly, the biological products that form a sheet scaffolding that encourages skin growth to occur. And the example that comes to my mind is the uh, acellular um, uh, xenograft, which is just a cellular matrix of um, sort of like fine strands of not really true tissue with, it, with cells, but a scaffolding that the patient's own skin cells can grow onto. That counts as a skin sense. Ugh, skin substitute grafting. Conversely, gels, powders, ointments, foams, liquids, injections, and bandages, however expensive or fancy they may be, that are meant to be either absorbed or removed later on, those are not skin substitute grafting, and those don't count um, as skin replacements, so be careful. Incisions and drainage. We have a deletion of a code, 20005, which was an incision and drainage of a subfascial abscess, which sounds nice on the surface, no pun intended, um, if every operator documented whether it was superficial to or deep to the fascia, and it doesn't even take into account the difficulty in defining what fascia is. Happily, we can just ignore that now. Now we code by the anatomic site of the incision and drainage, um, and here are some examples, 21501 incision and drainage soft tissues of the deep neck and thorax, or 27301 IND, soft tissues of deep thigh or knee. We still do need to distinguish these from a skin abscess, which has its own IND drainage code. And this is a case that might be a little tricky for us to distinguish in the documentation. This is a patient's knee, what looks like a superficial skin abscess, and my money says that it is, and would be coded thusly 10060. But if this were deep down into the tissue, as indicated by the term deep, and that's what we really, really, really hope the provider uses the term deep in the documentation, we would be confident in coding at 27301, a deep soft tissue of the knee incision and drainage. Bone allografts, we have some new add-on codes. So these are bone bank grafts, not autografts, and not to do with spine surgery. Any of us who have coded spines, are very familiar with these add-on codes for morselized or structural allograft uh, bone grafts. But these are, in the sense, structural grafts, and these add-on codes are meant for bone allografts when there is an excision of often a malignancy, sometimes a benign lesion, in the structural part or the articular part of a bone, like a femur that has a big sarcoma in it and that has excised out then some uh, structural bone allograft has to be placed in place of it. So we start with the excision code, whether it's an excision of a joint, curatage of a bone cyst, or an excision of a load-bearing part of a bone. Then we have the add-on code to account for the allograft that's placed back in where the bone was removed. And there are three configurations of this. The first is 20932, the osteoarticular 
allographed. And these, by the way, all include, this is in the descriptor, includes the templating, cutting, fixation, all the related work basically to put this um, puzzle piece of bone allograft back in place. 20932, the osteoarticular, you can break this down from the terminology, osteobone, articular. This is a piece of allograft which was presumably harvested from the articular surface of a cadaver bone, hip, knee, shoulder, and so forth, with a piece of bone extending from it. So if a patient had, for example, a knee sarcoma and the load-bearing part of their tibial plateau excised out, this osteoarticular bone graft would be placed in place of it. So it's got a bone part, it's got an articular cartilaginous part to replace the bone and the articular surface thus removed. So you have the excision code to take out the lesion, and you have the add-on code to put it back in. Next, 20933, hemicortical intercalary partial. That is a mouthful to say, but uh, in the parentheses, you'll see hemicylindrical. That brings to mind a much more clear image of what we're dealing with. But this is like half of the cylinder of a bone. And let's take a femur, for example, which has a large bone cyst on the lateral side that's excised out halfway through the femur, but leaving the medial part of the femur in place. So there's still some load bearing capability of the femur. We just need to fill in the sort of like half of that column with allograft. So we use a hemicylindrical, so like half of a Coke can piece of bone with a, a, a half of a cortex, hence hemicortical right there, and then slide that into place. And that will take the place of it. So we've got the incision code plus 20933. And then this is actually a little easier to comprehend. Uh, same uh, bone lesion in the femur, and they had to cut out an entire section all the way through the femur, cut out a complete cylinder, replace that with a complete cylinder. So intercalary just means in between the proximal and distal parts, and then cylindrical. So that's uh, taking out a whole part of the stack and replacing it with a piece of bone allograft 20934 is your intercalary complete cylindrical bone allograft add-on code. Changing speeds, here we have what probably could have been a, just a change in the descriptor, but we actually got a whole new code for injection for knee arthrography. So 27370, formerly injection of the knee for arthrography, that's the, just the injection procedure, not the arthrography. That was actually just deleted and then replaced it with uh, a CPT code just one digit below, 127369, injection of the knee for arthrography or CT MRI. And presumably it was simply that um, the injection procedure for CT or MRI was previously maybe a little bit of a conundrum whether it actually used this code or not. But now it just makes it clear that it is. So whether for plain film arthrography, which nobody does anymore, or CT or MRI, which is the very more common modality, we have a very clearly described and separate code for that. Now, this is only for the injection part. And this can be done for, like, you have to ask, why do they keep it separate in the first place? As with many of these cases, some, sometimes, hypothetically, one operator may perform the injection, like the orthopedist, but then the arthrography or the CT may be done by the radiology department, and then the orthopedist doesn't see any of those codes themselves. In, in reality, it's usually done by the radiologist, both of them but that's neither here nor there. Um, if ever the case where it was always only one person doing the entire package, those are the ones that kind of tend to get bundled, but in this case, not quite yet. Nonetheless, these are some caveats to take away from that. Um, if there is flora guidance of the needle placement into the joint, uh, that is coded separately, 77002. Um, so uh, depend, the knee is very easy to get into with a needle, but nonetheless, if a patient had a a large habitus, some kind of weird anatomy that required fluor guidance of the needle placement, that's different. Um, it's not hard to distinguish fluoroscopy from arthrography and CT. Um, just be be confident, and if you're going to use this code, that it's just for the needle placement if you're going to use the coding. Um, so this these uh, injection codes are for use with the imaging. So here's some example radiology codes uh, for arthrography, CT, MRI, and so forth. Um, now, do not use this with arthrocentesis. There is, I believe always was, an, an edit for this. Um, if the patient has an arthrography and then they, some steroid is placed in the knee joint, that becomes a free freebie. Or if some tissue, I'm sorry, some fluid is removed during an arthrography, that's kind of a freebie too. Um, 
the less clear or less obvious as to why this is the case, we do not use this code with arthroscopic lavage. There's an edit for that as well, too. So if the patient had an um, arthroscopic lavage, that's a pretty big deal. There's going to be some um, arthrography involved and some fluoro involved in that as well. Uh, we are not to use this code with arthroscopic lavage. Um, so here's a couple of examples of how this might be coded out. A right knee contrast MRI. So the contrast is the injection part by definition. There's no PO or IV contrast for, for a joint, not yet anyway. 27369RT for the injection part. Uh, 73723 RT for the MRI itself. And if this was a fluoroscopic placement of the needle to inject that contrast, uh, add on code 77002 for the fluoro. There are some new parenthetical notes related to multiple applications of external uh, dressings and uh, strapping for one extremity, and it breaks down like this. Only one modality per extremity may be coded. Uh, so strapping, unaboot, multilayer compression system like a Jones dressing. I suppose there was some ambiguity as to whether if multiple versions of these were put on, like one leg had an unaboot on the foot and a Jones dressing on the knee. We could code them both, now we can't. So you kind of pick your modality with the highest work RVU uh, for that extremity and code that once and call it a day. Functional endoscopic sinus surgery. This is a very special case of a code change for the drug eluding ethmoid implant. Simply a case of the uh, temporary code 0406T, 0407T. Um, graduating, so to speak, into their own uh, real live CPT codes 31299 and 31237 for placement of that ethmoid drug eluding implant by itself or when done with a biopsy, polypectomy, debridement, or otherwise in that uh, ethmoid uh, sinus. Now, these FESS uh, codes get um, pretty far down the rabbit hole, too, and um, they are, I like to think of them as being. Uh, recursive or nested in one another and so that's the case of the more aggressive or further into the sinus surgery it goes it includes everything that came before it and therefore they're exclusive of one another and there are complex edits related to these so and I realize I'm digressing a little from the drug eluding ethmoid implant a little bit but I just kind of wanted to dwell on this for for clarity too the combination hierarchy for the FESS codes goes roughly like this. And so a surgeon may do an ethmoidectomy total through a scope, and we'd code 31255. Then they go a little deeper and includes a frontal exploration and tissue removal. We throw out the 31255 and use 31253. Then they may additionally do a sphenoidotomy, and we throw out the previous codes and only use 31257. And then they dive into the sphenoid, tissue, sphenoid sinus even more and remove tissue from that. We throw out all the previous codes and use 31259. So it becomes like a Russian nesting doll in which um, only the deepest code is used and everything else prior to that is included. There is a simple point of clarification for a pericardial window or pericardiotomy. Um, plus a chest tube, and these are often done together, but now we do not code the chest tube with a pericardial drainage, which is actually the common theme for most thoracic surgeries in which the chest tube itself is um, not is part of, it's a drain, it's not coded separately too. So you'll find parenthetical notes with uh, 33020, 33025 for a pericardiotomy, pericardial window, um, and the tube core thoracostomy itself, 32555. That itself, it's a separate procedure anyway, you know, a CPT separate procedure. It's basically included in anything else. There might have been an instance where this was being kind of abused by thoracic surgeons, uh, inadvertently or not, um, coating the chest tube and the window. Now we just, it's a clarification that the chest tube 32551 is included in that. Now this, to me, is a case of some temporary uh, codes growing up that's much more exciting. Leadless pacemakers. This is a new technology that has FDA approval for use. So 0387T and 388T have been converted to uh, real live CPT codes 33274 and 75. So these are transcatheter 
We should tell you this is an interventional radiology or interventional cardiology type procedure, not an open procedure. Uh, leadless pacemaker insertion or removal and replacement for the first code, 33274, and then removal, just a straight removal without replacement, 33275. Uh, happily, these are very clear bundled codes, includes all the imaging guidance, the interrogation, and the programming. So it's a, all a slam dunk, presumably done by one provider, coded once per provider. Now this involves placement of that leadless pacemaker into the right ventricle, which has just uh, become the, the convenient spot to pace the ventricles from. It's also very accessible because it's the venous low pressure side of the heart. Um, so it's just easier to place this catheter through a vein, convenient vein, you know, subclavian or iliac, right up into the right ventricle, not have to deal with the high pressure left heart on the left heart, left ventricle is paced from this location. And this is the single chamber pacemaking site that all traditional pacemakers have always used in any way. It's just, this is a different uh, type of device. So nonetheless, that is a long-winded way of saying there's a right heart catheterization done during placement of these, but we don't code that right heart cath unless two things. There is a distinct indication from the pacemaker placement, uh, you know, again, like, a heart failure or something very clearly different from the arrhythmia that required the pacemaker. And it has to be a complete right heart cath with all of the same measurements, all the same injections as a right heart cath, not just road mapping, not just an incidental little squirt of contrast to see where we're at to put in this leadless pacemaker. So be cautious of that. So here's uh, what one of those might look like. There are really two vendors that uh, produce these under FDA clearance so far. And those are uh, St. Jude, which uh, manufactures the nano stem, and Medtronic, which is what's pictured here, the micro stem, too. And these are inserted with a catheter under guidance, fluoroscopic guidance, uh, very carefully placed into the bottom, the apex of the right ventricle, and therefore, by definition, it's a single chamber pacer um, placed in the right ventricle. And there are two, two different means, presumably patented, of fixating the device in place. One uses a hook and the uh, micro uses hooks, multiple uh, nitinol uh, memory metal hooks that are placed into the wall of the ventricle and they, they, they hook back to hold it in place. And there is the cathode from which the electricity emerges and the anode back here, which is kind of located if this was a normal pacemaker lead, there would be an anode back here in the wire and then some more insulated part and then a cathode that's resting against the the uh, ventric ventricular myocardium itself. And that's where anywhere where the pulse of electricity comes out right here. The battery life for these is about 15 years. And this sounds really cool. If I was going to have a pacemaker, I'd want one of these rather than a subcutaneous one up in my shoulder and then a bunch of wires that go down. Certainly there is still a risk of thrombosis with these leadless pacemakers. I'm going to guess probably not as much as with a lead pacemaker. Um, but look for these to become much, much more popular. And anyway, now we have those two new CPD codes for insertion and removal, all bundled. Remember that. Miniaturization and technological advancements have also brought us a small uh, change in uh, what could have been, again, the descriptor, but really brought us a whole new CPD code for implantable loop recorders and event monitors. So previously, we, we have these little devices that can be put under the skin that are like, think of it as an implantable long-term Holter monitor that met, monitors a patient's cardiac activity 24 hours a day, seven days a week for some interval of time. When I was a respiratory tech, we would put an external EKG on patients and send them home for a couple of weeks. And they would record that on a cassette tape that shows you how old I am. Uh, and then they would come back and that, that, that cassette tape would be interpreted. Anyway, that ultimately evolved into one that was implantable with a little bit of effort, uh, an open incision and placement under the skin into the soft tissues and that would measure that and uh, wirelessly transmit that to an external recorder. And then um, that could be interpreted. Well, the implanted version, the CPT code for it has been deleted as well as the removal, 33282, 33284 for uh, implantation and removal of the device and replaced with something that just more infers the uh, more the easier in uh, implantation and removal simply because it's smaller and it's put in place as a bedside procedure. 
really uh, just like a norplant or subcutaneous um, contraceptive or some such device. So we have new codes in any case. 33285, 33286 for insertion and removal of these now called subcutaneous cardiac rhythm monitor instead of implant, implanted cardiac event recorder. It's really just a little semantic shift. Uh, now you can see in the image here it's quite a, a small device. Uh, it has a certain battery life and will measure that patient's uh, cardiac activity for some time, export that wirelessly to a, a monitor that can be recorded, and then at some point presumably taken out quite easily again in the office because it's so small. And here it shows the, the old, so to speak, on the left, implanted, and on the right, the subcutaneous inserted um, devices. And these are either of these would be used for either a known or suspected arrhythmia to work up a patient who's having dizziness, palpitations, chest pain, syncopies, dizziness, something where you suspect they might be having an arrhythmia in between times that's not detectable when they're in the doctor's office or hospital, but are recorded in the meantime. So in any case, we threw out the codes for these. These are antiquated and no longer used. And we have the new codes for the subcutaneous insertion. And rounding out the trio of cool new implantable devices, we have the transcatheter um, placement of a wireless pulmonary artery sensor. This is, a, forgive me, an instance of a case where I've put in pretty much the entire CPD descriptor, um, just so it's uh, clear what, what the device is, what it's for, what it includes. And I've made a trend of that, and forgive me for reading, this, reading the slides in some cases, but this is a cool new device that's placed via tra uh, catheter, uh, right heart cath, similar to the, the uh, pacemaker before, but into the pulmonary artery itself. And this sits in the pulmonary artery, and it measures and transmits externally the pressure in that pulmonary artery. The value of this is in monitoring uh, heart failure for uh, progression, and for exacerbations. Now this, because this requires a right heart cath, you will see some pulmonary angiography and so you will see some right heart catheter uh, injection of contrast for road mapping and so forth. Those are all included unless, once again, it is a full diagnostic version of the right heart cath or pulmonary ang angiography and it's for a, a, it's a full study and, and a for a separate indication. So since this wireless pulmonary artery sensors are being inserted in patients with heart failure, it's hard to imagine right heart cath being for a different uh, indication. So 99% of the time, these are, are going to be included and bundled. So you can count on that too. Uh, so even though this is put in the pulmonary artery and that directly measures the pressure output from the right heart, it's really for global management of long-term heart failure management too. Some inferences can be made and the pulmonary artery pressure to the left heart, which is really where the pump action of the heart is and where heart failure mostly has its effect too. So just if you have to have one internal metric, the pulmonary artery pressure is a handy thing to have, and these little devices will help monitor those patients that have it. Now, how about the monitoring service itself after we place this pulmonary artery sensor? 93264 from the medicine uh, section of CPT is for the monthly monitoring service. Now the data is collected weekly, not certain how it's transmitted to the provider, probably over the internet. Um, it's so it's monitored all the time in the patient. It's collected weekly at the patient's home or place of residence, wherever that may be, and transmitted weekly, and then it's interpreted in a monthly batch, uh, probably graphed out. That's all included in 93264 on a one-time monthly basis. Also to do with the heart, but nothing to do with miniaturized devices. This is a rare and big procedure, the ross Cano procedure. It's actually kind of boring what the CPT uh, change is, but the procedure itself is pretty interesting too. Simply what we've done is created a new CPT code 33440, which combines the Cano procedure and the Ross procedure, 33412 and 13. So what those are in the new code, and forgive me for reading this again, but in case you're looking at something other than the slide here, is the replacement of the aortic valve by translocation of the autologous pulmonary valve. That's the patient's own pulmonary valve, and that's the Ross procedure, plus the transventricular aortic annulus enlargement of the left ventricular outflow, outflow tract, uh, which is the Cano procedure, and that's a dilation and enlargement of the part of the left ventricle that leads up to what was the stenotic 
aortic valve that's being removed and is now being replaced with a new and normally sized patient's own pulmonary valve that will now serve as the aortic valve. So they got to widen out the pathway up to the place where the valve is going to be and then they put the new valve in. So there, the most important part of the heart, the left ventricle has a solid aortic valve to pump through and a large aortic outflow, outflow tract um, or ventricular outflow tract uh, to pump the blood through up to the valve, so to speak. Um, so why they created a combo code, I'm not sure. Um, but any other ex procedures done in this uh, neighborhood, let's just say, are excluded. Any other procedures on the aortic valve, the root, the pulmonary valve, and the ventricle are all basically included. Um, I did a little research in this. In a time period of 10 years, there were 12 instances of this Roscano procedure being done. That was a, a few years ago, but you can count on probably not, not more than 10 of these a year being done, I would guess. And my email is at the end of this presentation. If you ever code one of these, I would love to hear about it. Uh, also to do with the cardiovascular system, the aortic arch aneurysm repair. It's a new code. It's really, what, think of it as a little bit of a tweak to an existing code. And in fact, it is an add-on code. And it is 33866, aortic hemiarch graft. And this is an, another case to please read or listen to the descriptor carefully, including isolation and control, not replantation, but isolation and control of the arch vessels. That's the innominate carotid subclavian arteries, comma, beveled open aortic, distal aortic anastomosis, extending under one or more of the arch vessels. So that is the important part to note. This is not replacement of the transverse arch in which the aortic arch is cut out, the arch vessel arteries arising from it, the innominate and the carotids and the, and the uh, subclavian, you know, the three vessels that originate from the aortic arch, those aren't cut off. They're just isolated and controlled. And then part of that aortic arch, that's the lower part that's underneath the arch vessels, that's replaced. That's what's being replaced. Now, this is an add-on code to the ascending arch or valve, 33860, 63, and 64. Those are various flavors of the ascending arch uh, with or without the valve being replaced. It's just when it sneaks a little bit further under the transverse arch, underneath the arch vessels, but does not include re-implanting re those arch vessels, this is your new add-on code for that. So once again, not to be confused with a complete replacement of the transverse arch, 33870, that's the whole aortic arch, and is re-implantation of the arteries. So that is your seal of quality is if you see reimplantation of the arteries, think the transverse arch replacement. If you see control and uh, isolation of the arch vessels, but not reimplantation, think about the your parent code for the ascending arch replacement, plus your new aortic hemi arch graft replacement. All right, the peripherally inserted central catheter has a couple of new codes. This is a little bit like the FNA with and without guidance thing, except they actually did recycle the old codes. So they have existing codes with some revisions and a couple of new ones. The existing codes for a PIC insertion for a less than five years old and five plus year old patient, 365, 68, and 69, had added to them without imaging guidance. Um, and this is really not that uncommon. It's not hard to insert a PIC line through a, like a brachial uh, vein up through the subclavian vein and ultimately into the junction of the superior vena cava uh, and the right atrium without any guidance, um, with or without just a post x-ray just to prove the position. That's not guidance, though. That's just a check placement, too. Um, so you'll see these all day long, and that's not a problem. But we have the new codes when it's, there is actually guidance, and that would include uh, ultrasound visualization of the venous insertion site to check for the insertion site and to visualize the placement of the needle and the catheter uh, and or fluoroscopic visualization of advancement of the catheter up into the superior vena cava down to the uh, right atrium too. So the new codes are 36572 and 73, conveniently right in the same neighborhood as the original codes and very clearly demarcated with as with imaging guidance 
with imaging guidance under five and five plus years old. Uh, being careful to note, these are all without port. These are not port cath insertions, completely different. The, wire, the uh, catheter is left hanging out of the arm or sometimes the subclavian area, but in any case, it's a peripherally inserted. It's not directly into the uh, inferior or superior vena cava, but the tip does come to rest right here. Um, so as I said, examples of that guidance would be venous ultrasound to check the site and entry of the, cath of the needle and or catheter and fluoroscopy. Those equal guidance. The chest x-ray taken afterwards is not guidance. It does not guide where the thing is going just to make sure that it ended up in the right place. And it's not billable when done for that purpose. It never was anyway. All right, moving down below the waist, looking at ilio, or sorry, inguinofemoral lymph node biopsies. So simply a new code 38531 for excision open of the inguinofemoral nodes too. So these are these nodes right here in the groin, which drain the external genitalia and the thighs. So if there was a malignancy in one of these areas, uh, these would be the lymph nodes that that malignancy might metastasize to. So now we have a distinct code for that. Uh, formally, these would probably be, be coded depending on the depth and what other procedures were done at the same time on a case basis would probably be coded as the superficial node excision 38500. Now there are lots of other deep um, open excisions of lymph nodes with their own codes like the deep cervical, the deep axillary, internal mammary. There are also several other radical excisions of organs that include the lymph node excision as well. And I don't want to go too far down that road. We're mostly looking at just lymph node uh, excisions by themselves for the context of the current slide too. So these are groin node excisions, um, once again, done for biopsies, not a regional lymphadenectomy where there's, for example, a hysterectomy or an orchiectomy plus all the nodes with it. Um, now it could be done with a cancer excision of the external genitalia or the leg, like a vulvar cancer would be a common one. But again, that is not a radical excision if it's just an excision of the malignancy locally and just a lymph node biopsy. It is interesting to note though too, please do use the right, left, or bilateral modifier with this new code 38531. Here are a couple of new codes that pertain to PEG tube or percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy tube replacement. Uh, kind of has to do with the with and without guidance thing, but it's actually a, another splitting of hairs one level below that. So let's start with looking at the PEG tube replacement with guidance. Skip down in my slide here to with fluoroscopy 49450 or an endoscopic version. Think of it as quote unquote guidance, guidance with the scope 43246. If you're dealing with either of those, you can ignore what I'm about to say, but if it's a PEG tube replacement at the bedside, like on the floor, in the office, or in a, in a minor procedure type of room, uh, when there's not guidance, there are two new codes, and it has to do really nothing with the guidance per se, but whether there's a tract revision or not. So whether there was any need to do any sort of small surgical procedure on the PEG tube tract where the tube goes through. And the new codes are this, 43762, PEG tube replacement without tract revision. And that's a sort of the garden variety uh, version where they pull the PEG tube out, you know, deflate the balloon, pull it out, put it back in, or maybe do a little dilation and put it back in and then walk away. That's 43762. Um, but where the real rubber meets the road in these new pair of codes is the with a tract revision, 43763. PEG tube replacement with tract revision. Okay, so what mounts to tract revision? There's going to be some incision, debridement, even insofar as creating some skin flaps that need to be sort of excised and translocated down into the tract to make it, oh, say healthier, or make it intact tissue, or make it bigger, above and beyond dilation. Now, an ordinary dilation is not tract revision. Let me drive that point home. Dilation of that tract does not equal 43763 PEG tube replacement with tract revision. You need to see one of these to use this new code right here. Nephrostomies have always given me a bit of a challenge too, in part because there's often a combination of codes being done, uh, 
procedures and the coaches that go with them with nephrostomies and their intention of re oftentimes removing a kidney stone. So let me give you a little bit of backstory before I actually go into the coding changes themselves. Um, so unless, unless you're an expert in nephrostomy coding, you can skip this, but if you're kind of an average coder like me in this area, uh, pay heed. So nephrostomy types, there's kind of two main reasons why we're doing it. Nephrostomy is creating a hole in the kidney from the skin down into the kidney. And the way I think of it is there are small nephrostomies. These are done for drainage of the kidney to allow urine to come out rather than build up pressure and cause necrosis and infarction of the kidney. Um, and these are often done because there's a stone, kidney stone, or some other obstruction in the ureter or somewhere downstream from the kidney between the kidney and the bladder causing back pressure. So these small nephrostomies to be, need to be done right now to alleviate that pressure until the problem can be dealt with later. All this takes is a small catheter, often you know five millimeters, in any case well less than a centimeter, placed into the urine, uh, urine collecting system of the kidney, the calyces or a calyx in the singular here. And then by design these have a little uh, pigtail curl in them to help retain them in the kidney. Um, there is sometimes a little bit of an incidental dilation and placement of these, usually with a needle, just simply punctured through the side of the patient's flank right into the collecting system of the kidney, and then a dilator placed over that to open it up just a little bit, and then the catheter is placed, connected to a bag, and then they walk away. That's it. So that's what I think of as a small nephrostomy. There's nothing, no solid instruments placed into the kidney. There's no substance or matter taken out other than the urine. Conversely, there's the big nephrostomy, and these are usually for the stone removal or some more aggressive intervention in the kidney. So these require instruments to be put into the kidney, and those are big. They're usually greater than a centimeter. And these often follow a small nephrostomy in the ed speak here, um, where in the nephrostomy, a small one was placed earlier. Now we come back to fix the problem. Now, so these big instruments require an actual dilation, a real concerted effort to open up that tract right there through the skin and down into the kidney to get those instruments into the kidney. So those are what I think of as the small and the big nephrostomies. There is often overlap between these so-called small and big nephrostomies too. So let me go over the three scenarios um, that involve just, just a small, just a large, and both type of nephrostomies. So scenario number one is the an encounter with the patient provider uh, that is just drainage only. So that is scenario number one, and that requires a small nephrostomy and, for example, 50432 placement of a percutaneous nephrostomy catheter, and that's an existing code. So we already have that. So that's the patient comes in with flank pain. They have a CT. They have a huge kidney stone in their ureter. Their kidney is dilated. It's at risk of um, ischemia infarction from that plus they're in a lot of pain, so they just zap a, a nephrostomy catheter in there, give them some pain medicine, and send them home. Scenario number two is what I say, the kidney procedure right out of the gate. This is not the most common version, but it can be done. Let's say that same patient comes in to the ER, they have massive flank pain, and they have a huge stone uh, in the ureter pelvic junction, and it's a Wednesday, and the nephrologist is available, for example. So they intend to take them to the operating room, perform the nephrostolithotomy, take that stone out right then and there in the operating room, and then admit the patient for monitoring, too. So we have a new code for that where they go straight to the operating room or straight to whatever procedure room, and they create the tract and dilate it right then and there. Now, this is separate and completely different from the actual removal of the stone or excision of cancer, and there's a, a number of other procedures that can be done through that tract, but just for creating that tract, we have a new code, 50437, for establishing that tract and dilating it right then and there. Now, once they've done that tract establishment and dilation, and whatever other procedures they perform through it, code those separately. Now, the third scenario is, in my experience, the one you're most likely to encounter, and that is seeing the patient initially to place a drainage nephrostomy, and then on a different day for the definitive procedure. And we have a new code for that is dilating the existing tract, 50436. So this was the patient in scenario one that had a nephrostomy placed 
for pressure and pain relief. They're sent home, and then they come back to the operating room to have that existing tract dilated and whatever instruments put in there to take out that stone, the nephrostic lithotomy too. So these two new codes, 50437 and 36, take the place of the old one, 50395, which was, I always thought it kind of ambiguously titled Introduction of a Guide into the Renal Pelvis with Dilation to Establish a Nephrostomy Tract. Was it a new tract or is it establishing a now dilated tract that you can operate on? So we don't have to worry about that vague description anymore. So once again, to re reiterate those, the drainage only, 50432 existing procedure, kidney procedure right now, 50437, kidney procedure to, a, to dilate an existing tract, 50433. Now, all of these include the guidance and a radiographic a supervision interpretation, so that that part's bundled. However, none of these include the definitive procedures like instilling the therapeutic agent, the nephrostogram, the nephrostolithotomy, and so forth, too. It's just for the skin part. And incidentally, an interventional radiology the radiologist may perform that tract dilation and then send them to the OR. So the nephrologist does all of these things. Um, and per, conceivably, that's why the, these codes are separate from the surgical procedures. New modality for prostate ablation for BPH, 53854. This is transurethral destruction of prostate tissue by radiofrequency, and this is the really important part, generated water vapor thermotherapy. The sort of brand name of this is Resume. I found a couple of uh, initialisms, convective water vapor energy or WAVE, W-A-V-E right there. Now the existing modalities, and there are many of them to ablate uh, prostates for BPH, microwave and radiofrequency thermotherapy, laser and the old TERP. Uh, the one that you might confuse this with is 53852 radiofrequency thermotherapy, because this new, the Resume uses radiofrequency and it ablates the tissue by heat, thermotherapy, but the key is this 53852 uses the radio frequency energy directly, and 53854 uh, makes steam, essentially. The radio frequency energy is converted to steam, and it's the steam that does the tissue ablation. So it's done by this catheter that comes up. You can see this sort of cloudy stuff, which represents the steam that's injected into the prostate tissue, kills that tissue, and then it just sort of uh, involutes and is absorbed later on. Here are some simple code deletions, rest in peace, uh, that were deleted for, to make space for other codes, and these just had low utilization or otherwise technically defunct. Uh, some were just kind of weird to think about, a fixation of the tongue with a K wire. I don't know what that's about, but they don't do it anymore. A sphincteroplasty with an artificial sphincter apparently has kind of fallen out of favor, but there are still sphincteroplasty by muscle transfer codes. Uh, there's some ligation of carotid, carotid, carotid arteries in various places. With repair, there's still codes for without repair, interestingly. Uh, here are a few more. I'll just kind of let you peruse over those. Uh, the only one I think that might have ever been used in my coding career would be application of TENS. They've just taken away that code. Presumably the patient does that themselves, or it's a nursing function. Now I have some new Category 3 or temporary codes for emerging technologies. I don't know if the T was meant to stand for temporary or technology, but in any case, that's what they are. There are a handful of these that, in, in my assessment, you're actually kind of likely to encounter, and I'll have slides on those directly, but I will... Uh, read through these uh, obscure ones in case you're just not reading the slide and looking elsewhere just so this is gone in your brain at least once if you ever see this you'll know that there is a code so there is extracorporeal shockwave therapy for for wound healing sinus tarsi implant removal and replacement intraprocedural coronary fractional flow reserve macular pigment optical density measurement by heterochromatic flicker photometry boy these are a mouthful Near-infrared dual imaging of meibomian gland of the eyelid, electroretinography, intraoperative visual axis identification, that's an add-on for cataract surgeries. There's a lot of eye ones here too, so if you code eyes, pay attention to these. Continuous recording of movement disorder symptoms, that's a kind of a medicine code. Uh, myocardial imaging by magnetocardiography.
Now here's one that you're actually kind of interesting and you may actually encounter. 050T, sorry, sorry 0505T endovenous femoral popliteal arterial revascularization. Read that title and see if that doesn't not make sense. Endovenous arterial revascularization. So this is very cool. It's like an existing fempop bypass from the femoral artery here to the popliteal artery down here past the knee where there's some blockage, serum blockage right here. Uh, but it's this is a closed procedure. This is a catheter-based procedure where the vein is catheterized, as is the artery, and the vein actually anastomoses it proximally and distally, all without cutting the patient open. That's really amazing. So um, hopefully this can uh, gain some traction, and we'll have a real CPT code for that later. But notice this is not a, just an ordinary fempop bypass. It's an endovenous one, so be careful if you're going to use this code that that's what you're dealing with. This is also interesting. I'm not sure how prevalent it's going to be, but uh, it's an interesting anatomical and physiologic lesson, so we'll drill down on it for a second. It's the Wireless Cardiac Stimulation System, or WICS. This is in clinical trials. It's not FDA approved so far. And this is for resynchronizing the left heart to the right heart, or more properly, the left ventricle to the left ventricle, in patients with heart failure who have already a pacemaker in place. Um, now I have a, a neat uh, cardiac presentation, which I delve into this, track that down if you like. Um, but the right and left ventricles ideally should contract in a very harmonious, synchronized way to gain the maximum amount of efficiency for that beat. Unfortunately, a patient is on a pacemaker. You see this patient, the patient has a pacemaker here, paced from the right ventricle. The electricity is transmitted incidentally to the left ventricle, so it's not really truly synchronized. So they lose some efficiency in the left and the right ventricles beating together in a heart that's already failing. So uh, this is a patient that could use all the efficiency they could get. So what this new Wix device does is it synchronizes the paced right ventricle by also pacing the left ventricle, but without wires. And how this is done is there's a sensor, a subcutaneous sensor, that uh, receives the signal from the pacemaker itself and then transmits a signal by ultrasound, I'm not making this up, to another wireless receiver in the left ventricle and causes it to beat there. So in effect, it's, it's kind of like having a lead into the right ventricle and a wireless lead in the left ventricle so that they both beat together. So there's a whole family of new codes here related to the placement of the receiver electrode in the left ventricle, the transmitter and battery. This is subcutaneous battery over here and transmitter right here. Uh, placement or uh, removal of either or both of those. So there's eight new codes. And there's also codes for the interrogation and programming of this. So everything that has to do with a pacemaker, there's a sort of an analogous code for this Wix procedure for the wireless transmitter. It's pretty cool stuff. One more new technology code, that's the intracardiac ischemia monitoring system. This, I believe, shows some promise, too. This is an implantable device for detection of ischemia or infarction. And this thing, as you can see from the illustration, it looks a lot like a pacemaker. It's inserted a lot like a pacemaker, and it has leads uh, right in the right ventricle right there. I don't know how this exactly works, uh, but in any case, this uh, transceiver transmits signals out to an external receiver and that receiver is connected to the internet presumably in such a way that the monitoring provider can uh, detect if the patient is having a heart attack. Pretty good idea for me. Um, think of it as an internal EKG shaped like a pacemaker and just like a pacemaker and just like the Wix pr procedure before there's a family of codes to do with the insertion, removal, interrogation, programming of, of the different parts, the electrode, the transmitter or both. Now into the medicine section. This is a new code related to electrocortograms. This is not the implantation of these electrodes into the deep brain, but rather, rather the recording and interpretation for 30 days worth of data from that. So we use one instance of this new code 95386. Uh, for the entire month worth of data of monitoring interpretation. So there is an electrocortogram at the time of surgery, 95829, and that's the initial measurement, but the month's worth of monitoring of it, 95386. 
For those of you that code neurostimulator analysis and programming, there are code deletions and new codes, but once again, it's mostly just a change in the definitions of the codes. So deleted are 95974, 7578, and 79, and the new codes are 95976, 7783, and 84 uh, for simple and complex uh, cranial nerve and brain neurostimulators. I could take hours to explain this, but I won't. If you code neurostimulator analysis and programming, read the guidelines and definitions carefully. But in a nutshell, really all these this code deletion in addition did was change the definitions in time. So it went from it defining as an hour or none for the cranial nerve to an hour and pl plus 30 or 15 minute increments of additional multiples for the brain. That's why you see that the add-on code right there. Um, difference. So it's just a matter of the duration of the analysis and programming, but really it's the same uh, neurostimulator analysis and programming. So once again, if you code these, please delve into the guidelines and definitions before you proceed in 2019. Adaptive uh, behavior services, we have some new codes for that, and essentially changed assessments to services. The A, the A new code range here is uh, 97151 to 58. And these were a graduation of uh, new technology or temporary codes right there. Here's a couple of examples of these. And in looking into these, it seems like adaptive behavior treatment um, is for kids with certain spe developmental um, conditions or disorders that they're basically just trying to get them up to daily uh, activities of daily living or sort of working with their environment and their peers and so forth. That's adaptive behavior treatment. Um, so if you're in a behavioral health uh, coding environment with youth, um, these would be some codes you may want to do a little bit of additional reading on. Developmental neurologic and psychiatric testing. Uh, there's a bunch of codes that were also deleted and replaced that describe essentially the same service, but they have to do with the time duration too. And there's also a lot of new guidelines related to these. So if you're involved in coding these or charging these, I recommend that you um, delve into this more. Now the um, developmental testing, the generic developmental testing has been split uh, into new time elements too. So the first hour an additional 30 minutes as an example too. And that's distinct from screening. So testing for developmental disorders, I guess once known versus screening for developmental disorders is distinct and different. Then we have some miscellaneous medicine codes. Uh, the one that I found that you might encounter if you code clinic um, supplies for injections, influenza vaccines are super, super common. Some coders are and some aren't responsible for capturing these, but the inactivated versus the split virus, quadru just the quadrivalent. So that's the kind that covers four flu. Um, there's a different code for the inactivated now, in addition to the existing split virus for what that's worth. And then the monitoring of the pulmonary artery pressure sensor that I described the implantation of earlier. And then also in medicine, uh, in particular, I like to emphasize there's a lot of new guidelines related to monitoring of this and all the pacemakers and ICDs. So if you code those, please check out the guidelines. In radiology, just a couple of housekeeping changes. Uh, 76001, fluoroscopy greater than one hour, um, was deleted. And many parentheticals related to that were modified as well. Uh, the fluoroscopy for less than one hour still exists. But remember, fluoro is bundled in a lot of other procedures these days. Um, as an examples of some of the notes you'll see under 76937, ultrasound guidance. Um, a lot of other procedures include ultrasound guidance, so don't code that with. And the parenthetical note under 77002, fluoros fluoroscopic guidance, needle placement, that's also included in a lot of other procedures, but not all, so that, that's why the code still persists. There is a new CPT code for uh, ultrasound elastography, and that in a nutshell is to describe how uh, flexible or fibrotic or um, compliant or pliable or not pliable a tissue or a lesion is. 76981 ultrasound elastography of parenchyma. That would be a measurement of the liver, the substance of the liver, the parenchyma, or any other organ really to see if it's uh, fibrotic or not. Uh, this would, might be a screening test for cirrhosis, where there's an indirect measurement of how stiff the liver is versus compliant. And now this 
modality can also be used for actual lesions in any organ. And the relevant codes there are 76982 for the first targeted lesion, not just the whole organ, but a lesion and additional lesions too. So elastography, that is your key term to look for for these. So once again, to assess the density of the organ, there are images in interpretation. There might also be some numerical values to measure the compliance uh, or uh, elasticity of the organ too, but note that there are some images and some interpretation by the radiologist. This can be done with, even on the same day as a diagnostic ultrasound, to visualize the lesion for the diagnostic and to measure the, um, the compliance of the lesion too, as in the new codes too. Now these are um, particularly this one, ultrasound elastography, is different from a shear wave liver elastography. Uh, so be careful to note that fine distinction when choosing your code or charge. MRI of the breast has been split um, from the with or without contrast into discrete codes that include without contrast and with contrast, and it's simply uh, unilateral and bilateral, unilateral and bilateral, with and without contrast too. That's your take home message there for breast MRIs, and those may be done the same day as or different day as mammography or other modality. There are some new E&M related codes, uh, one of which is 99541 and 42 for what amounts to a consult, a remote consult uh, with just a written report. Okay, five minutes or 30 minutes worth of time spent generating that report. Contrast that with the existing codes 99446 and 449 that's, as, as best I can tell it describes the same service, but it's a verbal and written reporting. So this would be more the standard uh, principal uh, provider in the hospital or clinic setting calls a consulting physician and, and describes to them what's up with the patient. They talk to them on the phone and they get the verbal um, description of the consultant's recommendation and a written report versus maybe they just send an email to the consultant and then the consultant goes in the EHR, looks at the record and just provides a written report only without ever talking to the uh, initiating physician. Also remote monitoring some new codes of physiologic parameters. Like so this may be oh a Holter monitor for example and the physiologic parameters would be heart rate, uh, the initial setup and patient education of how to deal with that gear, and then each 30 days worth of supplies, electrodes, catheters, and so forth. There's a new code for that. And then 20 minutes or more of interactive communication, uh, maybe to guide the pa patient who's at their house, you know, how to deal with this stuff, not in the clinic, but at their home. Chronic care, the new code opened up for the personal rendering of that chronic care by the physician or qualified healthcare professional, 99491. The existing code, 99490, was uh, provided by clinical staff directed by the physician or other qualified healthcare professional. And the best I could tell is the distinction was it's not just directed by, but actually personally provided by that physician too. So we just got to know who's, who's doing the work the physician or PA or NP versus directed by the physician or NP or PA. This is only used once per month in any case, and there is a bunch more detail in the CPT manual describing this that is beyond the purview of this presentation. What follows is an abbreviated uh, exploration into the administrative changes brought on by OPPS. The final rule from CMS was over 1,100 pages too, so there are a lot of minute details, but here's just a handful that tangentially relate to coding at least, so stick with me just for a little bit, and if it starts to seem irrelevant, you can dip out, um, but some of these might f you might find uh, relevant to your coding practice. First, inpatient-only procedures. There were just a couple of changes to. Um, there were four procedures um, removed, so they can be done on an outpatient basis and coded legitimately in CPT and, uh, and reimbursed accordingly, and there was only one procedure added to the list. So these are the procedures removed from the, the inpatient only uh, nasal sinus endoscopy with ligation of the sphenopalatine artery that's done for posterior epistaxis which can be life-threatening um, and presumably that's why I was inpatient only before because it's kind of a big deal but now it's not on the inpatient only. Um, there is two anesthesia codes removed from the inpatient only 
uh, which followed along with the surgical procedure, presumably for a knee arthroplasty right there, and for spinal cord or spine and spinal cord procedures. Those are not on it. And then the this very obscure implantation and replacement of carotid sinus barrel reflex activation device, which was a new technology code anyway, removed from the inpatient only procedure list. Here is the one inpatient only code added. It's a HICPICS code for the facility. It's a C code used for the facility. There is an ordinary surgical uh, procedure code for the position to use, ordinary CPT code. But this is uh, really just a straight up PTCA during an MI, C9606, uh, with uh, drug eluting stents, any combination of that, atherectomy, and thrombectomy too. So this is a special case. And by golly, you look at this procedure, this looks like an inpatient only procedure. So that's kind of a slam dunk. So if you're familiar with using uh, HICPIC C codes for a facility, uh, make note of this one. For APCs wise, particularly comprehensive APCs, there are three new ones related to ears, nose, and throat and vascular procedures. So there are 65 comprehensive APCs now, and we're, I could not find any additional details on that. Some procedures now allowed in the ambulatory surgery uh, setting outside of a hospital too, and I've listed those. They have to do with the uh, cardiovascular angiography codes right here. So if you code for an ambulatory surgical center that is doing or is considering doing cardiac catheterization, diagnostic cardiac cath, um, these new codes may be acceptable in that setting. And there's a bunch of other ones apparently in consideration too, and you just have to recheck with these every year to see if they're allowable in the ASC setting. Rural Solo community hospitals and essential access community hospitals uh, have a, apparently a surcharge or bonus of 7.1% um, adjustment to the OPPS payments. So if you work for one of these, thank you for providing that essential service to um, these uh, small and rural hospitals. And uh, it looks like CMS is trying to take a little extra care of them. Thank you for joining me for the 2019 CPT and OPPS code updates. This has been Ed O'Byrne with Healthcare Resource Group. I would love to hear from you at the email address here, eobyrne at hrgpros.com. And uh, good health and happy coding in 2019.